Can you pinpoint where the American suburbs are? It's almost obvious, right? Urban planning in America is so inconvenient and bad that it has become a meme. However, this city planning nightmare stereotype doesn't apply to cities such as Boston. Why? Let's find out. If you would like to see more videos on architecture on this channel, be sure to give us a like and tell us which topic you want to learn about next. So, why does Boston deserve the title of the most European city in the US? Let's hear from Betty, architectural expert, the creator behind YouTube channel Articulations, who lives in Boston. I moved to Boston, Massachusetts last year, a city that is highly walkable, has extensive public transit networks, very few grids, lots of medium to high density buildings, and even has lots of architecture that look like they're directly plucked out of Europe. This radically differs from the typical American suburban area where most Americans spend their childhood. Endlessly long streets of one-story houses, no public transportation, and very remote infrastructure. In such neighborhoods, you simply cannot survive without a car. But it wasn't always that way. In the 1930s, over 75% of Americans lived in cities or urban areas. Today, less than half do, with the majority of Americans choosing to live in suburban or rural areas. A century ago, the US was also a world leader in having some of the most advanced and widely used public transit. However, today, outside of a few major urban centers, public transit is nearly non-existent in the US. And Betty is not the first to notice this subtle European scent in Boston's vibe. Of course, European cities come in many different forms. However, a common theme among many European cities is a tension between old and new, where historic buildings and old neighborhoods are interwoven with contemporary buildings and developments, such as in London, where the Shard and Gherkin Tower above many historic landmarks around the Thames. So what's the main problem with American city planning? In a nutshell, it's cars, a lot of cars, a pretty damn big number of cars. Most American cities are designed for the automobile. They consist of grid-patterned road systems, they are rampant with urban sprawl, and are really completely pedestrian-unfriendly. I mean, really. Visit any major city west of Virginia and you find out that it looks like this. Humongous, super-ultra-fast highway that went through the city center, a small downtown with a couple of skyscrapers, and around that area, infinite single-floor suburban that scratches all the way to the horizon. So if the secret of sustainable city planning is in the synthesis of old and new, why didn't other American cities experience such a change? Aren't they old enough? Look at a map of the United States at that time, and you will realize that the oldest colonial cities were founded by Europeans on the Eastern Shore. That is why they were most influenced by European architecture. In addition to the influence of the European style, the fact that these cities developed organically, without global planning, as cities that were founded in the 19th and 20th centuries played a significant role. There's a reason why most European cities and some of the oldest American cities are situated on rivers and other major waterways. Because before the steam engine and railway travel was invented, traveling by water was the fastest and most efficient. Hence why port cities have historically been centers of trade and commerce, which in turn resulted in them becoming large urban centers. Thus, unlike planned cities, which are often inland, organically developed cities like Boston and many old European cities have little to no grid patterns and often have streets that more resemble a bowl of spaghetti. Boston's growth was largely organic and occurred well before the invention of automobiles, resulting in narrow streets, smaller buildings, and compact city blocks. This layout lends itself to a pedestrian-friendly environment, with many streets resembling old European cobblestone lanes. Notably, Boston was the first U.S. city to establish a subway system in the 1890s. Today, one-third of its residents use public transit for commuting, a significant figure compared to the national 5% average. Even with its transportation challenges, Boston's transit system ranks among the nation's best. Boston ranked particularly highly in terms of accessibility and convenience. The average commute time for transit users is just under 40 minutes, which is one of the shortest in the country. 
While post-World War II North America saw a stark divide between single-family homes and high-rise towers, Boston remained an exception. It maintained a medium-density cityscape filled with townhouses, triplexes, and low-rise apartment buildings. The city's tallest building, the John Hancock Tower, doesn't even rank among the country's top 60 in height. Historically, Bostonians resisted ultra-high-rises. Factors like the city's zoning height limits, FAA height restrictions owing to proximity to Logan International Airport, shadow restriction laws for historic parks, environmental regulations, and residents' love for the 19th century aesthetics all contributed to limiting high-rise developments. Boston's architectural heritage mirrors many European cities. For instance, the King's Chapel exhibits Georgian architecture reminiscent of England, while the Isabella Gardner Art Museum emulates Venetian palaces, Boston neighborhoods feature Victorian-style houses with intricate designs. Moreover, Boston introduced distinct architectural styles. The Boston granite style was pioneering, blending classicism with European rationalism. When comparing U.S. and European cities, differences in design and lifestyle emerge from intricate historical nuances. While many European cities had to rebuild post wap II, they emphasized walkability, limiting urban sprawl, and providing amenities like plazas and pedestrian streets. In contrast, U.S. cities are generally designed around automobiles. Boston, however, stands closer to its European counterparts in terms of urban design and aesthetics. You might be wondering, so what if Boston is a European-like city? Why does it matter? Well, it shows that one of the most American places can also be one of the most European. While Boston is not without problems, it is an example of moderately sized, human-scaled, culturally eclectic, and mixed-use cityscapes. It is still an open question whether the rest of the U.S. will be able to change to become a pedestrian-friendly country rather than a car-friendly one in the near future. Americans are still very much attached to their cars, but Boston's experience can definitely inform and provide better understanding for planning new neighborhoods and cities, so that one day, urban planning in the United States will no longer be a meme, but will become an example of urban planning for other countries. Cities like Boston have also changed a lot in recent years, especially since the pandemic. A lot of office buildings are sitting mostly empty due to a lack of on-site workers. Since there's such a huge housing shortage, why aren't we converting more empty office towers into residential buildings? If you'd like to learn about that, head over to my channel, Articulations, to watch my latest video. So what do you think? Will the example of Boston become a model for other cities? Or are we stuck in this loop forever? Let us know in the comments what you think and don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube and Instagram for your regular dose of culture from Curious Muse. Also, if you enjoy our content and would like to receive actionable tips and insights that help you grow, make sure you subscribe to our free newsletter. Check out the link in the description and see you next time.